Well, happy holidays. Um, it's really a big pleasure to be here uh, at the end of this year. And we have a really great presentation today, so I'm really thrilled. Uh, we plan to give you a sort of overview of the year and also what we're going to do in the future. So we would like to collect also feedback from all of you so we can make this better for, for you. And so with that, a very warm welcome tonight to all of you. Thank you so much for coming out. Wonderful to see you and happy holidays. This is the SFCDI group, San Francisco Computational Design Institute. And uh, this is definitely a community of people who come together from all kinds of different fields. Many different people here are in the ABC industry. I'm more from the creative industry, uh, but we'll go into that and we'll go ahead and get started with our good stuff here. We also have Jack, who will be presenting from NVIDIA uh, as we finish up our introductions here. And that will be extremely exciting. And so we've got the announcements. You may sign up for a monthly newsletter for the announcements at sfcdi.org. And then when you do participate at the event, then you get subscribed to a newsletter from there. And of course, if you don't want that, then you can unsubscribe. You know, if you have a, a more of a problem, then you can contact the team. <laughs> but, um, you know, don't hesitate you know, to reach out for pretty much anything that you have questions about. Uh, people were really happy to answer those questions for you. Um, and right now, if you're tuning in live, uh, you are muted, but please write any questions that you have and then someone on the team will get back to you. So pictures will also be taken. I uh, just wanna let all of you guys know that and they could be shared on social media. Um, so of course, just like come to me or Alberto or someone else if you don't want your picture posted. I will definitely respect that. Um, and then, yeah, just any feedback at all, just uh, come tell us or the email. And how many of you, this is your first time attending an SSCDI event? Nice. Nice, well, welcome, guys. Uh, a little bit about SSCDI. This is a nonprofit organization. And we all welcome you to join this community of people who are really eager to learn and share and build together. And so I'm used to touch screens here. <laughs> uh, I want to give a big thank you to the team members who are part of SFCDI. And we have the president, Caesar, here with us. <laughs> Glad to have you. And then we have... Oh, <laughs> we have Stone treasure. Young, our the treasurer. We have Alberto, who is the secretary. Nice to have Hi. you here. Pleasure. <laughs> we have Colin. He's in holiday right now. Started his holiday. Danny. Dennis, who is here helping out. I think he might be at the, the front door. Here yep. you are. Jennifer Marketing, who's in the back. Thank you. And then we have a lot of volunteers who also help out. I'm a volunteer, very happy to be here. Um, and this is our team, so thank you for everyone who makes this possible. And of course, Google, who are in this space today, Google Launchpad. And I will hand some more announcements over to Alberto. Thanks a lot, Anna. So uh, we want to present what we did in the past month. And this is a specific event that we care, uh, this is Autodesk University. Uh, it hosts 12,000 people uh, in our community in the AC, but um, not only that. So they have the slogan this year, better starts here. So we want to bring this welcome to the new year with a better wish for the new year. So we present, we contribute with our energy and passion to different topic. The first was about open source and non-profit. Why we care about this as a specific uh, social experience of the, the open source, to sharing together a project to the community. The second one it was about automation and Dennis actually presented really well. I don't know if you do want to add something. You mind uh, to share your experience over you? It was, uh, it was a lot of um, interaction, a lot of uh, uh, engagement. Just briefly, yeah. So we had we had a good theater talk today about automation. Um, it was really practical talk about things that you can automate right now using some 
really easily available tools. I think that might be of interest to a lot of you here, um, especially for those of you who are BIM vendors who are interested in automation. Um, and so in addition to the theater talk on automation, which is also available on Autodesk's uh, EU website, if you wanted to take a look at that later, and we posted it to the SFCDI uh, YouTube page as well. Uh, we also had a, a, um, a meetup there about um, hackathons. We talked a little bit about like the hackathon format, uh, the kind of topics that come up. Um, hackathons, I think, are something that are really new to the EC industry, uh, but I think something that we could um, definitely uh, use a lot more of. They're a great way to introduce new ideas um, into the industry, which we definitely need. Um, and so yeah, so those are the two yeah. presentations that I was part of. Um, and I think um, Alberto will finish off with the, the other presentation he did. Awesome, thanks Dennis. So as Dennis mentioned, yeah, we did this open source and not open source. That is the question. It's a big topic for a company and startup. Uh, what kind of business model they should start and why? So we have this amazing panel that I would like to thank again, Ian Kiel, the creator of Dynamo and Hyper, Matt Zazik, now senior staff software engineer at Tesla. We have Kelly Hode, she mainly developed BOM, it's an open source project from Guru Apple. Danny Sheldon is the previous creator of Gary Technologies and now currently director of Digital Building Laboratory at Georgia Tech and Zach Cronon. So, uh, as finalize of the, the outcome of the panel was the spread of the open source community. And we would like all of you share your work, what you're working on as part of the community, how you're helping the community. So I would like to play this video of that Beam girl, as you may know, is really big voice in our community. And um, let's see if we can. Sorry, the connection. To pass around this uh, RTD project between different people uh, interested and in, passionate about computational design. So, yes, I'm supposed to take a pic. So, it's really the R2D2 drawing. Uh, CF, CDI, 365. And uh, they can share something. Yeah, it's really one you can publish in Twitter, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. Yeah, maybe it was not the right move. But so the idea is actually to share this R2D2 with all of the people around the world. It started in Vegas, now it's in London, and we are trying to keep sharing with the picture, and then you can publish what you're working on. You don't need to try it, you can just put the hashtag. We hope to arrive at 365 picture and the people that share what they are doing openly with the community. And we are gonna pick also the best next year so we can do a presentation about that what people are doing around the world. So we did this presentation about augmented reality and deep learning uh, in the design process, the automation stuff. So this also what we present to the EU, what we are supporting. And I think uh, we have a voice here that travel a little bit in the next, con in the other continent uh, around the Pacific, and we would like to hear also her experience. Yes, so we are, we are giving back to the community and we're going to bring up special guest today, Michelle Buckles, and I will introduce her. Michelle will tell us about her recent participation in the Construction Climate Challenge and Volvo Group Hacks Grant. Michelle brought a business perspective to her team drawing on her 15 years of business development and investment marketing experience since getting her MBA at the Haas School at Berkeley. Michelle has also been focused on sustainability issues and impact investing for the past nine years, including two years spent living and working in Rwanda and Ethiopia. Michelle's interest now lies in working for a company contributing to sustainability and resiliency by design. So please welcome Michelle. Um, Alberto, do you want to show that video? Or? Yeah, we can try it. YouTube is not great. So. Oh. So we'll start with this video for the hackathon I participated in, and then I'll personalize it a little bit. Nice to be here and welcome everyone. So. <laughs>
We want your help to connect science with the real world challenges of construction. See you there. Awesome. This slide. Yeah. Okay. First. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. So welcome everyone. I'm very glad to be here and I'll just tell you a little bit about my participation. It was my first only and unlikely participation in a hackathon. So I'll, I'll get into that. I was originally encouraged to uh, participate in the event by Alberto. And then when I told him how much fun it was, he encouraged me to encourage all of you to participate in future hackathons. And I guess that's a theme that, that Dennis was talking about there. Um, so the hackathon was focused on the construction industry. It was the climate, um, clim construction climate challenge and Volvo group hackathon focused on decarbonizing the construction industry. So that's obviously a very big task and one that I know many of you are interested in and we're all working hard to create a more sustainable and carbon free construction um, industry. So the reason I say unlikely is because I went originally because I have an interest in construction climate issues and in sustainability by design in the built environment, but I certainly don't consider myself a hacker and I didn't plan on joining a team. However, when I got down there, it was well organized and it was, there were a lot of interesting people around, so I decided to dive in and hack with my colleagues here, which are Maxim and Anabob, Dimitri and Vikram. So we were all strangers to each other, but with some, um, we spent some time debating what we were going to focus on. And the challenge was for specific parts of the construction industry uh, related to the construction site. So we decided to focus on the materials transportation of items from the source, it might be the quarry or the mill and what have you, to and from the construction site. So including waste products going back to uh, where they need to go. Um, so we spent 12 hours on a Saturday and six hours on a Sunday. So basically, and a Friday night getting to know each other. So basically an entire weekend to come up with our solution. It was an algorithm to be used by a logistics manager. And this is actually an example of the decisions that a logistics manager might need to make in terms of where the material is going to come from and what's the most efficient way to get them to the construction site. So our algorithm consisted of inputs, of course, including distance, but also truck type, in particular Volvo truck type, fuel type, uh, diesel, renewable diesel, hydrogen, and electric were considered, and also driver efficiency. And this would enable a logistics manager to select the best route and the best source of the materials. Cost of the materials was also included, but importantly, we were adding the carbon output element to it. Now, I'm not a programmer or an engineer, I'm a business person. But I realized I could add value to, in, to our team project. So I proposed business questions like, how will our tool help, um, help make better decisions? How can we drive, not only assess the amount of carbon, but drive down the amount of carbon used for these construction projects? How can we help companies meet their, tar their carbon reduction targets using our tool? So we also added additional inputs and they were setting a price on carbon, setting a maximum amount of carbon allowed, and creating a bonus and incentive system for meeting carbon. So that way, management can inspire and drive reduced carbon usage, in addition to having this more valuable information. So this is our team solution, which after that time spent, we presented it, um, including a risky live demo um, to a group of seven judges, and alas, we did not win the $10,000 prize, which when I first went down there, I didn't know there was a $10,000 prize, and that motivated our group considerably. <laughs> uh, did they sleep? We did sleep, but, did sleep? Okay. 
We, we spent all the time possible. Yeah, so we worked right up until the end. So um, it was, you know, perhaps it was a little disappoint, disappointing not to win, but um, there were five other groups. Um, but I think our group really was a group of winners and that we all had fun, we had spirited conversations, it was really thought provoking. Um, I didn't expect to have fun, and I didn't really know what a hackathon was. It was fun, it was really interesting. So I, I recommend it from that perspective. So, although it was unlikely to begin with that I wouldn't participate, I probably will participate again in the future. And now I call myself a hopeful hacker, um, hoping that we all together, collectively and urgently, can work towards um, a more sustainable future in the construction industry. So, thanks very much. Okay. And speaking of hackathons, so coming up in the new year is the MIT Reality Hackathon. And uh, we support these kinds of events. We support this type of collaboration, as you said, people getting together, really sharing these new ideas that can build in the long run. And so, uh, of course, Alberto and I will be going to the MIT Hack uh, and hopefully sharing something really exciting with you guys. Uh, it's more of a mixed reality XR type of hackathon, um, but we'll, we'll see what comes out of it and hopefully present something cool here. Yeah, uh, Anna actually was part of the, the previous hackathon as a tutor and now she's going to be a hacker. Yes. So let's see if uh, we can win together. Our team actually was able to participate and win in all the hackathon that we did and that we develop all the prize to back to the community. Uh, so that's part of the nonprofit mission we have. So feel free to join with us if we're going to win again, we're going to share with the community here. So talking about Hackathon, at the AU, um, it's really a fun event because you can connect with people, you can drink a lot and people, and you can think about how to hack also people. And that's what we did with Dance Works. We provoked them to organize for us Hackathon online. So they they promise us to do it. So we are waiting them to organize this hackathon. They are really nice and they are going to do all this work for the community because they promise now. So I want to stay tuned of this. Um, it's going to come up in the next year. It's going to be a hackathon online. So everyone can participate and we have a bet on it. So we would like to thank a lot uh, all the speakers we had this year. And we want to also give a prize to the best presentation. Uh, we were really flattered to have Mateus uh, with us last year. Um, he won because he had uh, in one year, less than one year, almost 1,000 views and 45, 44 likes. So because of the actually the percentage, he was one of the best speakers. And so a big round of applause to Mateus and his presentation about application of machine learning design. And then. Uh, um, I came here in this nonprofit because actually there was um, a recognition from the other side of the ocean, from our president, Caesar, to the best fan and the best follower, because I was following at 3 a.m. in Italy. And uh, I would like to do the same, and I, I give back to the community and say who this year was one of the best follower and fan. And so, the best follower is so, we really enjoy also our sketch and it's part of our vision of the future computational design is about human. So it's going to be, and related to that part of human encoded memory and the workshop you've seen about machine learning, we as a nonprofit also publish a chapter in a book. Hannah here, Andrea also as well here, they all help writing this chapter that is carrying all the value of technologies and new technologies specifically. So feel free, you have a discount from our group. It's 40% discount, it's a $270 uh, book, pretty expensive. Uh, we are donating this to the library and some university in the, in the area as well. So to say that we join uh, the, this great effort that Autodesk is doing, they start this year the group network. So they can help and we want to drive this, uh, help all the other user groups around the world to become a non-profit. Because in this way, all the money has to be developed to a specific goal. So 
we are sharing the bylaws, we are sharing all the article of incorporation to help the other group to become a non-profit. So hopefully, uh, we, we should have the confirmation today. We're gonna present the GTC next year, in March. Our group is, has been invited to present, so stay tuned. And uh, we select also the best happy holiday wish. I don't know if you've seen this cyber truck going around Twitter. Uh, we want to thank Simon for this happy new year and happy holidays. So this is our gift that we are giving to you as a community. It's our Christmas gift. We organize with Microsoft and MBBJ, thank also to, to Gensler, the Machine Learning and Computer Vision in Architecture Workshop. It's a free workshop for 30 people. You can register now. So if you want, go online, it's published online, you can participate. It's limited, unfortunately, to 30 people, but it's all free. We had Microsoft as sponsor, so this is our gift to the community for Christmas. So I'm gonna pass the microphone to Hannah to, for the thank you part of our sponsor. And uh, I think I would love to, to hear also from Hannah what she did, she, got, she flew back to my country, Italy, to share her passion and work also with our community there. Yes, so I want to give a big thank you. Uh, once again, we are in the Google Launchpad space and providing refreshments for us tonight. Uh, and I also have a type of nonprofit with Alberto called DreamShip. We focus on XR for pediatric research and care. Uh, and then, so yeah, as Alberto said, I, I work a lot in computer vision. And so I'll show you a demonstration at the very end of tonight to conclude things off. Um, creating experiences that are augmented that pretty much pop off or bring your product to life. So 19 Crimes, Coca-Cola, I'll show you Coca-Cola since it's Christmas and the holidays coming up. Um, and the whole thing will turn into a whole scene that's interactive. You can throw snowballs at the polar bears and um, that's all fun. But also really importantly in Italy, uh, I also met with the Rento Piano. I'm um, sure you guys are all familiar with him, the group, and talking about pediatric healthcare and how in the future we're going to be thinking a lot about how technology will reshape the buildings that we're in. And that is the children's hospice. We were looking at that and how the design goes into that specific building uh, for end of life pediatric patients. Uh, happy to talk more about that with you guys later. We're going to have another networking period at the very end if we've got time. Um, but again, uh, our other sponsors, Gensler uh, and Tactic. Tactic is the company I work for with all the labels, uh, provided the booze. So, continuing on. So, now I can introduce Jack Dobrin from the video. He is the project manager and he oversaw the two beautiful buildings that are in Silicon Valley, the Endeavor and the Voyager. And he's going to give us a talk today about how augmented reality, virtual reality, and artificial intelligence play into the design and building of those beautiful structures. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Jack. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, it's exciting to see all kinds of different people here. Um, I'm going to walk through, um, you know, Hennett mentioned about 18 different things. I, I can't talk about all of them. So uh, I'm gonna try to weave a thread through uh, some projects which so far have stretched through since 2012 until today. Um, our current project will end in 2021. And then we have a phase three, which is still TBD. So, um, so many stories to tell. Uh, I'm gonna tell one of them. Um, Today is the eve of the winter solstice, and one of the key things uh, that, that our company deals with is really light. And light has a huge impact on human beings. Um, in ancient times, um, they built structures to, to capture, to measure, to, to celebrate it. Um, this time of year is a holiday season almost everywhere around the world. Uh, pretty much for that reason. Um, so that's one of the main themes I'm going to talk about here is how light uh, is important to us. Um, darkness is also pretty important. Um, I was going to introduce myself here. Uh, I'm the design manager and project manager for a couple of buildings at Intel, uh, NVIDIA. Uh, I took a long detour 
um, many, many turns around the sun uh, between being an architect, an active architect, and coming back to the world of architecture and construction. I, I spent 10 years at Intel on CPU design and then moved to NVIDIA in our silicon operations group. Um, and then um, in a casual conversation, I mentioned that uh, this new project they were thinking of sounded really interesting and I was an architect. And uh, next thing I knew, I was recruited to the team and, and uh, became the project manager for it. So it's been a very interesting uh, journey. Uh, I started out actually in pretty ancient times. These are the tools that I actually was using when I was an architect um, before I left this book. Everything was manual. Um, we had all of these things. And then pretty much at about the same time I was uh, graduating from college, um, Autodesk came out with AutoCAD in a really usable version. And uh, shortly after that, I left the profession and went into construction management. So um, I have a huge gap in my learning. All of you guys know so much more about computational design than I do. Um, but Autodesk and AutoCAD were really a um, example of kind of a big bang. It was the confluence of a number of different things coming together. One was um, cheap hardware. Um, and graphics cards, we could run a program at last uh, that anybody, even an architect who's you know making several dollars an hour, uh, could actually afford and and build a business on. Um, I think we're on the cusp of another sort of confluence in that regard, and I'll get to that a little bit later in my presentation. Um, but now onto my project. So Nvidia. Um, we're sponsoring GTC, so you guys are all probably aware we are a GPU maker. Uh, GPUs are used for uh, all sorts of visual computing, uh, computational design, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, uh, all types of automation, etc. And as our business has grown, we really needed to bring our company together. Uh, we had moved on from just gaming and graphics into a number of new businesses and our, our population was growing and our CEO said, we need a new building. We need a building that's going to capture the soul of our company. And so you search around for architects. Uh, we ended up with Gensler. Uh, their San Francisco office was, the, was their uh, lead designer on this project. And he charged them really with making a building that would function for our population. So it wasn't about form, although form has something to do with it. Um, but it was really a question of how do you get 2,500 people to collaborate? That was the population of people we needed to house. We had five smaller buildings on our site, um, each of which had you know, one division was self-driving cars, one was cell phones, one was uh, etc. And as we grew, each of those divisions grew apart. And we looked towards some research from Tom Allen at MIT who said, proximity is important to collaboration. So his research shows that people who are on the same floor of a building have a 90 90 to 95% chance of interacting with each other. If they're separated by a floor, it drops to about 20%. If they're in another building, it can go way down there. Um, and if they're across uh, the site, it, it can almost go to zero. And so Jensen's first response was, well, let's just make a big one building, which um, arguably is not a bad idea, except it burns up all your space. Uh, so Facebook did that with their large building, uh, but we wanted to be a little bit more compact, a little bit more efficient. And Gensler came up with an idea of placing our work pla workspaces around the perimeter and filling the center with a heart, uh, 
one thing about collaboration and bumping into people is it's it's great. It brings people together. But as most of you probably know, when you're sitting working on a problem, you really don't want to be disturbed. Uh, so placing all of the busy and noisy functions in the center of the building, our reception, our coffee break areas, our conference rooms, our cafe, our restrooms in the center of the building, um, meant that people had those opportunities to meet together. Um, they're almost forced to. Our parking is under the building. Everyone rises through a central stair. So twice a day, uh, you're entering and leaving. Many more times a day, you're getting a cup of coffee, going to a meeting, etc. So it offers many, many chances for that close collaboration. And yet, around the perimeter, it's very quiet. It's extremely quiet. We spend a lot of time developing uh, a design Um, with a faceted roof. And this has some degree of uh, noise reduction. It's constructed out of a material called Epic Deck. It's really an acoustical attenuation material. But it also is faceted in a way so that we don't get direct reflections anywhere. Um, and coming from an industry where 3D graphics use a triangle as our basic primitive. This faceted, folded, geometrical object really spoke to our CEO as representing the company. So um, a bit later in our project, we were trying to find ways to reduce the cost and uh, we asked them to do some other studies on the roof, flattened it out and brought that into uh, our CEO. And he says, oh my God, you stole the soul of my building. Um, so drawings were rolled up, taken away, and uh, we went back to this design, which uh, really has become the sort of signature for the building. From here, we want to talk a little bit about the design process. And our design process is very idiosyncratic to our company. Uh, silicon design, I was mentioning earlier, um, to someone I met here is very similar to architectural design in the workflow. We start out with a program, a list of requirements. We go into some rough floor planning. Um, we develop um, alternatives. We go through change orders. We finally produce a CAD drawing of the chip, um, which is sent to a fab uh, where it's converted into silicon. And that process and the people involved all have very similar skills and uh, similar processes to um, the design process. But one thing that's very important to NVIDIA is we have a philosophy of simulating as much as possible through a computer simulation before we send it to fabrication so that we can get it right the first time. Um, the first iteration of a chip, the first time you send it to a factory to get fabricated, takes 12 to 13 weeks, costs millions of dollars. And then when the chip comes back, if it doesn't function, you are doing that whole thing again. Now the pace of innovation in silicon is very quick. And if you go through a couple of those, you've lost half a year. You go through four of them, you're a year late. So uh, from the very beginning, Jet, uh, NVIDIA has invested in machines and in algorithms and in technologies that allow us to simulate the chip so we know what it's going to be like when it comes back. And our CEO challenged us to do the very same thing on this building so that we wouldn't have to wait we wouldn't have to go through large numbers of change orders. We wouldn't get halfway through and then change our mind. Um, we wouldn't have the, the delays and cost overruns that seem to plague almost every building that's out there. Um, and here's just an example of a chip. This is not our very latest, the previous generation. Um, it has 18 billion transistors. It's about two transistors for everyone on Earth. Um, and incredibly complex. So if we can simulate this, our CEO said, we can certainly simulate a building. 
And to do that, um, we put together a technology which we call iRay. And iRay is a photorealistic ray tracing simulator. Um, it ran on um, a machine that we call the VCA, a visual computing appliance, which had 16 nodes, eight GPUs per node, and you could send uh, your 3D file to it and it can render it in near real time. And we use this extensively to analyze the building, to understand how light would work in the building, how which areas of the building are going to be pleasant to sit in, which ones are going to be too hot. Many of the design decisions um, went against the architect's intuition. So, for example, the area that's here in the back, you can see a couple little triangular skylights. Um, initially, our architects thought that area would need 17 skylights because it had some, some degree of symmetry and they thought it'd be nice and bright. Um, when we plugged it into our model and simulated it, turned out six was the right number. Um, so that attention to um, the accurate simulation was really important to us. And the simulation that we would get out of a typical rendering tool just wasn't going to cut it. Um, here's the, the building in real life. It, it's pretty similar. Um, we, made a, we made a couple changes and I took this photo from a slightly different angle, um, but it's remarkably the same. Uh, and that level of trust in your tools was really important to us. We also used the building as a laboratory to prove out some of our other technologies. Um, one problem that's faced in a world of automation or in a world of uh, robotics is understanding what a camera or a laser scanner is seeing and turning that sea of point clouds into real objects. Uh, so we did some experiments with that. Uh, we captured the whole building, 3 billion uh, points over the life of the project. And because of that, we developed a number of algorithms to introduce blue noise, introduce uh, to handle that. So somebody who's going out and scanning a building may be able to make sense of it. That work still continues. I don't think that um, we had any product which came out of that, but we like to generate those toolkits, um, those algorithms, et cetera, and share them to the world so that the others can build upon it. And as a result, um, we ended up with a building which uh, people are pretty happy with. This was the open house, so we don't typically have dancers in the building. Um, um, we should, maybe. Um, you can see in that black area, in the center, that is the heart. Uh, it functions as a sort of social center, and there's a number of plazas around it. Our cafe is adjacent to it. Uh, perhaps a little too adjacent because uh, the sound does travel up a little over around the corner and hit the workstations which are above it, uh, but it's generally all right. And then up at the top, we have a social space, um, which is a bar uh, from five to seven. So if any of you come to visit, that's a pretty good time is to arrive at like 4.30. <laughs> um, And this I included because it, it's, um, it's the architect's view of the building, um, which is just a single person. And uh, I did a Google search this afternoon to look at, typed in architecture. Um, almost all of it is just images with no humans. Um, so that soul of the building is not about creating form. It's really about creating places that, that people can use, uh, that people can enjoy, uh, um, that they can gather. And to do that, we need to include more people in the process. So our next building is called Voyager. 
Um, it is adjacent to Endeavor, which is the first one. You can barely see it behind the words there. Um, new buildings under construction. It rained one day, so this, this photo was uh, just begging to be taken. And along with that original inspiration to, to bring people together, to collaborate, um, we kept our same design team. We took Gensler as our, our designer, but we added to it. So on the left is our original workspace, um, which was to, to get everyone together. The second building was designed to join together with it. And to do that, we introduced a new element, which was a park that goes between the two. Um, because of that, we had some new players in the game. Um, and the park shouldn't sit alone. It should be just like our heart brings people together. That park should be the heart of the ensemble. To do this, we brought together uh, a set of landscape architects. On the right, we can see Walter Hood and Alma uh, from Hood Design. They are in Oakland. Um, we have Eugene Lee and Hao Ko from Gensler uh, working together. And having that sort of creative tension between architect and landscape architect um, helped us off of sort of a formal ensemble and really push ideas about how people work together. And the idea that they came up with was really to blend the outside and the inside. And you'll see some of that going a little bit further. Um, but having more people in the process meant it became a little harder because each of them had their own tool set, each of them had their own work process, and each of them had their own design studio. And so we pretty much fell to lowest common denominator. So here's, here's one of the examples of our models. Uh, you can see it's printed out with a Xerox machine. There's some little coffee stirs, maybe, um, et cetera. But we fell back from that um, ability to simulate everything to um, being in our designers' imaginations again. Um, and it was really difficult. And this was because, one, we'd outgrown our boundaries of what was simulatable. Landscape, as it turns out, is much more difficult to make it photorealistic than a building is because trees have limbs and leaves, etc. Um, but we attacked it with technology uh, on the interiors. And one of the things that came out of it was our RTX technology, which is a real time ray tracing functionality, which is built into our current GPUs. And that allowed us, instead of having to use a massive compute server, um, to just use a graphics card to get uh, realistic lighting at reasonable costs um, and bring that to the world. So hoping that um, as more people get used to this, we're going to get better designs out of things. Uh, we're going to enable that uh, democratization that AutoCAD or AutoCAD brought to designers. Um, so you won't submit a design and wait overnight and have come back to you. I'm going to go through the building just a little bit because we're pretty proud of it. Uh, and I, you know, designers always like to see other work. Uh, this is a view of the facade of it. And if you compare that to the, my initial image, um, it looks a little friendlier. Uh, it's got a large vertical glass, clear glass entry into the inside. And that's to make that connection with the outside a little bit more explicit. Uh, the landscape also has elements of architecture in it. So we pulled structure into the park and we pushed greenery and landscape into the building. Uh, here's a view of the lobby. Um, the m metaphor behind this really was um, where, whereas the first building had a heart, um, this building has a mountain in the center. And the mountain contains our laboratories, 
inside of it. And then those public functions that were in the heart have been spread over the top, almost as if it's been unfolded. Um, and you traverse your way up, break areas, coffee rooms, restrooms, conference rooms are all along your journey up that mountain. And at the top there, there is a bar uh, pretty much in the same way that we had in the first building. Um, when we started the design of this building, there was no bar in the building. And we, <laughs> and, and we brought the drawings in and uh, rolled them out and said, Jensen, here's, here's our plan. And he says, I don't, there's, where's the bar? <laughs> I go, well, it's not there because we have one already. So no, I, I think we need one here too. Um, so we searched about and we tried to figure out where it should be. And we put it out near the cafe. And our cafe in this building is brought forward. It's not in the middle of the building. It's at the edge where it can join up with the landscape. And Jensen said, no, 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 you can't put it there. It's the first thing people are going to see when they come in the building. So we moved it. We moved it towards the back, over on the back side of the mountain. They said, no, 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 you can't put it there. It's in a pit. Okay. So we said, where do you want it? He said, we'll put it on the mountain. So we put it on top of the mountain. And now it's the first thing you see when you come in the building. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it will be spectacular. Here, here's the view down from it. Um, Along the way, we found so many pain points, and um, we are always one generation behind in our technology to solve our current problems. We're always stretching. We're always trying to find things that our technology can do for us, but because it's evolving at the same rate as we're building, uh, we're always trying to catch up. And these were some of the big pain points that we found. Um, one, the fragmented tools and workflows. So that's even, you know, even within Gensler, they've they've got so many tools they use. Um, making them all work together is difficult. And then you add in another firm, uh, which has a different set of tools. Um, it compounds itself. Um, the second thing is there's a high amount of latency uh, from sort of hand waving sketching to reality. Um, I mentioned how much computing power we put at something, and getting your model ready uh, to be accepted by that high-speed tool took a lot of work. Um, RTX has, has solved some of that, but there's still a large amount of it. And then there's, um, and that's just a technical path. There's also the human side of it. So we've got designers who have technical skills that are incredible, um, but the work that they do shows up at a design review a week later. And then humans are, who are concerned about how we're gonna occupy the building, look at it and make some suggestions. And then it goes back and then it goes back. And that loop is just very, very long. And it's not as inclusive of all parties that need to be together as it should be. Um, and then once again, we're spectating into that world. Uh, at least from my side, you know, I'm comfortable with an uh, HB pencil and an eraser, but I'm not going to go in and go into Grasshopper and reconfigure the roof. Uh, it's just not my skill set. Um, so we are spectators and we can't really collaborate. And as an example, here's the tool suite um, Gensler used for Voyager. Dozens of tools, right? The ones in pink are the ones that actually got used on the project and they don't all share the same file format. Um, they don't all interoperate. Autodesk would love to make use just stay in their, their garden and um, have all their tools work together, but that's a tremendous exercise for them as well uh, because as one version's up, another may not. Um, so our designers, our, our, um, our software engineers uh, came up with an idea which we called Omniverse. And Omniverse first solves the problem for NVIDIA. Uh, we develop hardware, but we also develop drivers. We de 
of software development kits um, that apply to every industry. So one example would be the game industry. We'll develop um, the ability for you to simulate physics realistically in a game or make hair look real or have a certain type of shadowing, et cetera. And we develop those capabilities and we deliver them to the industry. They can include them in their products and they can make their product just the same and look beautiful. Um, and that's fine, but sooner or later with multiple game engines, uh, each with their own format, we face the problem of making each one of those plugins have to work with each one of those tools and it becomes an end time to end problem. Um, so we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a common format which could be used that would sit on our platform that everyone could plug into and then when we develop a technology it could just plug in as a service rendering as a service physics as a service etc and it became known as omniverse now we weren't the first ones to think of this um pixar actually had a very similar problem they have artists working on character development rigging coloring all sorts of different functions uh, working together and they had a very similar problem they came up with this with a file format called usd universal screen now well, scene descriptor um, which is essentially an open source format uh, which can include geometry it's a schema so you can layer other attributes on top you could layer cost you could layer time you can layer opinions um, you can layer versions on it and we took that as the basic um, building block for Omniverse. And we're building a number of solutions on top of it. One of the solutions is for the AEC industry. And here's an example. Um, we are trying to prove out how large it can go, how well it can scale. And as I mentioned before, at our landscape, adding three large buildings, billions, billions of, of uh, polys, polygons in it. Um, Omniverse handles it. This is a ray tracing of uh, light passing over it. We just used a white model just uh, to simulate how the light is gonna pass through this trellis, hit the facade of our new building, and then uh, you can see it spreads out into the street. This was not taken on the solstice. I think this is a September day, uh, but you can control time of day, time of year, etc., and start to get that sort of uh, rendering fidelity. And any model can go into this. So we'd like to, uh, we're trying to develop plugins for Revit, Maya, Max, etc. It allows everyone to collaborate and it allows us to view into that model at the same time the collaboration is going on. Um, I'm gonna show a couple items here. This is the China Resources Tower in Shenzhen, which we used as a model and took it into Omniverse. Uh, and here's the results. Uh, this is pretty early days, but it just shows you that uh, a very massive scene can come in because we're using um, path tracing we can get results out of it very very quickly and it doesn't care about how many polygons there are so it scales uh, to city scale um, and it allows us to do those sorts of things that we really wish to do what does it look like in late afternoon what does it look like in the morning The results of this are very early. Uh, what you saw was from an alpha build of Omniverse. Um, I'm not in our product marketing side, so I can't tell you anything about when it's gonna come out next. But um, if we look towards the future, we still see some deficiencies. So it's still a very visual world. And this is a, it's still a very narrow portal. This is uh, Hauko on the right and our CEO uh, doing a quick design review 
Um, but I like to think they're looking into the future. So the future for us um, holds a number of things. One is increasing fidelity. So I've been talking about light this whole lecture, but sound is incredibly important to a sense of place. And if we can model the interactions of light waves on materials in a space, in a simulation, we can certainly do the same thing with sound. And along the design of Endeavor, we did some experiments um, with 3D sound, with uh, adding sound to virtual reality. And the increase in reality, the increase in a feeling of volume and location was incredible. And when you turn it off, you feel the loss. Um, so here's a photo uh, I took in, we have an anechoic chamber which we used to test our products, make sure they're not too noisy to fit on your desktop. Um, and I took someone in there and it's a little unnerving when you hear no echoes, when you have no spatial sense of where walls are uh, because there's no echo. And he came out and he says, my biggest fear now is going deaf. Um, so it's, it has a profound impact on human beings, almost as profound as life in perceiving your space, in perceiving who's next to you and where you are. Um, so I think this is one of the frontiers uh, that we're going to be trying to take it into as well. Um, and I, I guess I'd like to close uh, with a shot. This was also taken at our open house. And it's a quote from John Walker from Autodesk about predictions. And I wouldn't have predicted 10 years ago that we would have these capabilities that we have today. Um, we're moving into spaces with AI, with simulation, with automation, with robotics that I think are incredible opportunities. And I'm really excited to see that, you know, communities like this one are exploring those and trying to move them forward. And we'd like to support that uh, in any way that we can. So I'll just close with a, a sunrise shot. Hopefully this is what it looks like tomorrow. The sun should come out. I mean, it usually does on the solstice so far. Uh, and then some credits. Uh, Gensler, our architect, has been a great partner. Our landscape architect, Hood Design Studio out of Oakland. Um, I meant, I heard you're from Berkeley. But you see Berkeley? Uh, so uh, Walter Hood's a professor there. I, I went to school there at the same time. He was there at How Code, likewise. Uh, DevCon Construction is our design builder, and they've been a fabulous partner as well. They really have a owner's point of view. And that was really necessary to bring the owner and the architect and the landscape architect together and to create a place that fits our needs. And I think technology, uh, if it can speed that interaction, if it can make the design process easier for architects, they can spend more time learning what it is the customer wants and then delivering on that promise. And then our development partner is a company called Ceres Regis. They're out of San Mateo. They were instrumental in getting our entitlements, et cetera, and also introducing us to some of the new technologies which are out there. All right. So uh, any questions? So my role, um, NVIDIA is an interesting company. There's no really, roles are roughly defined, uh, but I was the project manager. So uh, project manager for Endeavor meant making sure that the architect and the builder uh, understood what we needed 
and that they were delivering what we wanted. Um, and then a large amount of change management around that. So this is a new type of space for our people. Uh, so figuring out how we're going to convey that to the occupants of the building, making sure they're happy that they, they understand it. It was a major change. Uh, if you saw the cubicle areas there, they're rather wide open. Um, and most of the cubicles were t that they came from were taller than this TV. They were gray. You couldn't tell who was in them at any time. And so many people were afraid to go into those new spaces. And we did a uh, survey uh, three, four weeks after people moved in. And it was, it was a bipolar results. We asked what, what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, the major thing they didn't like was it was too open and distracting. And the major thing they liked was it was open and airy. So um, we did another follow-up six months later. And the number one thing they didn't like was the cafe was too expensive and there was no gym. So they all those concerns about it being too open and distracting had disappeared. But that's a process. So we, we took people through the space. We talked to them about the attention that we put into making sure that it's going to be quiet in quiet areas that um, nobody's going to be sitting next to that conference room where people come out and talking really loud. They're separated by 20, 30, 40 feet. So the sound just dissipates over that distance. So as soon as they spent time, they understood. Um, but change management was a huge part of my job. Um, so that's it. I'm owner's representative. Yes. So I really like that to see that architect, like if you listen to Louise Khan last year, talking about the bricks. And if you listen to software company, you're talking about the human. That should be the same final goal of the architect as well, the community. So based on this human value that we media carry, how your CEO played the role? Like you put the bar at the top, you didn't put the CEO office at the top. So how he plays, he has an office, he works. Well. So, our company in typical Silicon Valley, uh, I guess, vernacular, uh, no one has an office. Uh, we've always had goals. Uh, everyone, most of our leaders sit with the groups they work with. Um, our CEO, until a couple of years ago, uh, also just had a cubicle. But he's got a rather loud voice, and sometimes um, he's talking about things which could be a little more private than everyone needs to know. Um, so we moved him into a conference room, and he essentially will sit in a conference room, and his meetings come to him. And his meetings, when they're done, everyone leaves. He stays, works on his laptop. Etc. But he roams. He goes around. He goes uh, where he thinks he can add value. He's very participatory and he encourages that participation across groups. So my participation is not just limited to the typical you're a project manager role. It's, it's what do I have to do to make this building work for us? Right? And I think that, val that sense of value that uh, Know, identify problems, resolve problems, bring teams together which have the skills to resolve those problems is part of, part of our culture and it's probably one of the strongest parts. That really led uh, to my involvement in some of these technologies. Um, a normal project manager would just say, hey, you tech guys do this, but I felt, you know, I can help. And so I've become uh, involved helping our team supporting AEC with examples, with opportunities to test out our designs um, on a real level. So this, that the spirit of collaboration is, is really key to the company. Yes? So what did you say about you were actively using them and all of the people that people that they might not have to do to go back to design and also make 
Yes, so the question is how does the feedback that we got from our occupant um, make it into um, the environment and whether the environment is changes to the existing building, um, changes to the way we design future buildings, um, or just communication um, and maybe accommodate for people who are in a noisy spot and maybe they need to go to a quieter spot. It's, um, it's done in a number of ways. So we do gather it and we do speak with our, um, our architect and say, don't do this one again. Uh, for example, there's a, a bank of cabinets that the bottom of the upper cabinet is at eight feet. We said, please don't do that. Uh, it looks beautiful, but nobody can open it. Um, and I don't know if there's anything in there. I, I, I should go see what's in there. It's going to be interesting after a couple of years to see what's up there. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, we do feed that back. We've been really fortunate on our second project to have some time between it and the other one. And if you'll notice, uh, if you can think back to those images, the first building was heavily influenced by the triangle. As I mentioned, that's sort of the design primitive for all 3D graphics. And Gansler took that as a motif that they wanted to repeat as often as possible. It's in the floor joints, it's in the ceiling, it's in everything. Um, unfortunately, it's in a couple of conference rooms and a triangular conference room, super bad idea. Second thing that's a really bad triangular form is triangular parking lot because no cars are triangles except for those funny three wheel things that some people drive but not many people do um, so so our new our second building is actually a rectangular building within a, a sort of polygon shaped shell and our parking garage is a lot more regular and rectangular uh, the other thing that is really difficult with the triangular building is human navigation so humans are used to making a right turn and then another right turn and they know they're going back the other way if you make a right turn how many degrees is it it's like two, uh, whatever you know it's, it's many degrees and then if you make another one you start to lose track of where you are and um we had to develop an app so that people could see the floor plan of the building to find conference rooms but even that is difficult for people because they're looking at a triangle and they go, well, which side of the triangle is which side of the triangle? Um, and there's a couple landmarks, there's like the cafe, but most people can't read floor plans. Um, so they're totally confused. So squares, rectangles, mountain in the middle, some valleys on the side is gonna be a much more uh, human readable environment. Yes? So in terms of the planning process, uh, where you kind of set the goal for your triangle accomplish? There process. I mean, everything has a process. Not all processes are formal and are documented. Um, and in fact, our company often, you know, speaking back to you, you learn every time time you do something, right? So your process should be with you. And if you're constantly documenting it, it's, it's going to be invalid the next time. So our CEO has a principle that he likes to use, and he says, um, identify the, the principles, the first principle that you're going to use, and then you don't need to remember anything else because you can always derive them. You can derive the design from your first principles. So uh, some of those very obvious collaboration to quality of the environment for people, right? Including sound, what's the light like on their cubicles, et cetera. So those core principles are used to decide or validate a design. And what process Gensler takes within their office to develop their design, uh, maybe idiosyncratic to, to Gensler, I don't know, um, but they, they seem to do it fairly well. Um, 
And when it comes back and, and we say, why did you do this? They say, well, it looks cool. You go, well, does it meet the first principle? You go, yes, then fine, let's do it. Uh, occasionally they'll, they'll go off in a direction and you go, that's, that's not where we're going, right? That's not the direction. Uh, that doesn't fit our principles. And that sort of correction uh, makes it back through feedback. Yes? Hey, Jack. So you spoke about your CEO's intention that simulation be an important part of the process. Yes. Um, and obviously, your organization has really well developed skills in making visual simulation a part of the process. And you spoke a little bit at the end about the potential of acoustic simulation. Um, Maybe the first question is, how did you use simulation in the design process? How did Gensler respond to the outcomes of simulation? And what other areas of simulation would you be curious about in the future outside of just the visual? Um, it's kind of a long question. Uh, and some of it predates my involvement. Uh, but the I know initially there was resistance to the effort required to get those first simulations going with a brand new tool um, that required you know a rather sophisticated model high dependence on technical support and people to to get you through that alpha phase uh, however once they saw the results they were incredibly bought in and said wow we can actually make designs that hold up, right? And um, as we progressed, we added new capabilities to it. One of the key ones was VR. And VR takes it from two dimensions where you're looking at a curated view to one which is uncurated, where the customer has an opportunity to look around. and. Uh, that slide back here. Let me go backwards in time. One more. Okay. Um, this central lobby here designed in in theory, but also very much in plan and from top down it was incredibly symmetrical each one of these columns at the uh, edges which are a big flange had a diamond shaped aluminum cover on it the handrails all came to perfect points and when you looked at it in the 2d renderings you're like oh my god this is fabulous and then we put on the VR goggles and we turned around, you stood at the top of the landing as if you were coming up from the garage, approaching the reception desk and you stand at the top of the landing and go, I can't get there from here <laughs> because you'd have to walk past that perfect point on the handrails and then around that six foot column cover and then back to the reception desk. So we cut the handrails back, we removed the column covers, and the, the beauty that it was in 2D was maybe harmed a little bit, but the functionality and the feeling of the space came to life. So I, I, that sort of experience uh, is invaluable, and that, that sort of simulation, uh, the, hot, the more fidelity you can get, the better your decisions are, the more certainty you have. And design is always about removing uncertainty. Every project, you constantly want to reach a point where you're removing uncertainty. And this, uh, being able to do that faster, more interactively with a broader group, so you get that certainty, you get the collaboration, you get uh, that consensus. Uh, that's what a collaborative process allows you to do. Yes. Hi there. Um, what sustainability features did Gensler or the project on the way for, and did you adopt? And then which did you not adopt and, and why? Um, so 
Gensler um, worked with Atelier Penn, also a local firm, as our sustainability. And they did all the lead work on it. It turns out to be a, a lead gold building. Some of the major things that are, I think are highly sustainable are the presence of natural light. So natural light helped us a lot. It reduced the amount of electricity we used to about 20% of what we projected. So our model said we need X amount, we're using about 20%. Most of that is because we get natural light most of the day. And it's a soft light, we've, you know, we modeled different types of glass to understand what's gonna give us glare, what's not gonna give us glare, how much light is too much on the screen. And um, so that was a, a huge win for us. Second thing is huge volume allows a, a very simple way of conditioning the space. So, uh, when it gets warm, the high volume allows all the hot air to rise up through convection, and then we just blow it out of the building. Uh, so our cooling is much less than you would expect for a building of this volume. It's all open, so we don't have a lot of fans and things to, to make that happen. We just let convection do its work. Um, and weather here is mild enough that heating is not a huge problem because um, we've got, everyone's got a, a high-powered desktop under their desk to keep their legs warm. <laughs> yes? Uh, did Alivia try to like extra purple desktop and graphic card for Gensler for the project? Um, I, I believe we did at times. <laughs> um, I, I know certainly we've, uh, we, we are partnering with them to um, prove out our technology. So a lot of these experiments will require the latest graphics and, and we Sometimes do get that available. Yes. Uh, Could you talk about the timeline of this project? Like the, how long it takes for the impediments and when you get a building permit and how long the construction? I, I can, but it will probably take until the next solstice, which is in the summer. Um, <laughs> it it uh, started in 2007 with the purchase of the land. Uh, the goal then was really just to house our people and original design was three multi-story buildings, kind of typical, you know, office buildings. Um, then the global crisis, economic crisis came, we put it on hold. When it came back, 2010 or so, uh, the design ideas had crystallized in our heads and that theme of collaboration emerged. And then we went through a period of pre-construction took a long time, uh, trying to get design right uh, to match our budget, uh, working with various contractors to get pricing, uh, et cetera. And entitlement uh, actually started way earlier with that original design. So it didn't, it wasn't a time constraint on that part of the design. Um, phase two, we had about a, 12 to 18 month design cycle, uh, just a modification to our development agreement. So it was pretty minor with the city. Uh, after they saw the first building, they, um, I, I think were pretty happy with the quality of buildings we were adding to their city. And so we had a pretty good cooperation on the same phase. Yes. So I think onto the and as a technology company, um, one of the use cases for our VR and AR is um, architectural visualization. So, and your products actually support the basis of you know, infrastructural um, hardware support for that. So, how has this experience informed the product as a company in general? And, and also, can you talk a little bit about the AR glasses that you guys are developing as well? Um, I can't talk about our products because I'm not a product guy, um, but I can tell you that the pain that we felt on designing our buildings um, informs our future products. So RTX, which is our real-time ray tracing. I, I can't say that one product 
one, one project was the cause of it, but it was a contributing factor to making that happen. Um, and this fragmented set of workflows and tools that we experienced um, is a contributing factor that says, this is a, it's a problem we have. We know everyone else has it. Let's make something that can fix it. So I, I think there may not be a direct one-to-one -one link because AEC is a smaller part of our business overall, but it's a universal problem uh, that faces all designers, whether you're in product design, whether you're in automotive design, whether you're in even software design, they've got similar challenges. So um, there is a relationship, it's not a hard one. Yeah, so one of the things that you alluded to is you thought that we were in the midst of a kind of a fundamental change in the way that people design, similar to you know, when all the cat came around. Yes. Um, if you were going to just prognosticate a little bit, say 10 years from now, what, what are the qualities of the software that, that What's it going to do to help us? How will it change from, from what we have now? Is it certain as if you're having to sort of shim on some, some improvements with a certain existing set of problems? So um, today's talk was about simulation for the most part. Um, and simulation of light and space and how light reveals form and how form is basically the architecture. And I didn't cover at all any of the stuff that regards to AI. And I think AI is, you know, simulation is becoming mature. It continues, as you point out, it's let's optimize, this, let's speed it up, let's expand the pool of people who can enjoy it and uh, reduce the cycle time. AI promises to do something totally different, uh, which is to, at least from a practitioner's point of view, I see it as being an ideal architectural intern. It's going to help you generate layouts, toilet rooms, um, code compliance, all of the tedious stuff that takes you away from thinking about those bigger ideas. Um, the difficulty with AI is the, the AI boom is predicated on a couple of things, actually three things, algorithms, hardware, and data. So the data is the most difficult part and that's what's missing at this point uh, that makes it difficult to say I'm gonna do AI work. Our tools, um, use AI in them. So our, for example, RTX uses AI denoising, uh, which senses a pattern and it fills it in. So you don't need to do as much rendering. You can get the rendering quality, equivalent quality in a quarter of the time because AI says, I know what that's gonna be and it predicts it and it recognizes pattern and it fills it in for you. Um, so AI in that sense, you know, pattern recognition, uh, filling in things, you know, coloring things in, um, certainly is gonna hit soon because it's, it's based on sort of visual aspects. Determining the patterns of use, how people use space, um, gathering that data and then making decisions about how to design a space to, to optimize that uh, is the future. And I'm super excited about it. I, I talk to everyone I can about it, uh, and I think it's going to happen, but it's going to take some time. I think we, we need to wrap up <laughs> at Sorry. the top of the hour. We can continue the conversation uh, informally. I just want to thank uh, Jack very much for his time availability. I work not for Gensler, Sorry, I understand now that this, this, this is a feature project that we are very proud of, and I know NBA is very proud of. So, uh, we're wrapping the year with a, with a great speaker, and we're just lining up a big set of names for this year. 
Uh, as you might have known, we have uh, Marcel Stambaguri for February, and we have uh, uh, Robert Otani from Toronto from City, and, uh, um, uh, and Peter uh, uh, from NBBJ uh, in March. And more big names coming here. But this community wouldn't be anything without your support and your attendance, and especially with the energy that the community members bring. Uh, Roberto and Hannah and Jennifer and Dennis and Danny are moving all the spaces to put this event together. Um, we are part for our events and our community. This community is about opening doors, connecting people, and not wait another generation to see this thing all over time. So, uh, opening door to new organizations, between people, uh, uh, cross communication, and it's all about you, about, about this community. So, a big applause for everybody. So, thank you for being here. Part of the, the non-profit, we would love to have you. I mean, it's part of the I, community. It's really open to everyone. Yeah, I mean, I would have no problem with it. I mean, I'm sort of just dipping into everything okay, yeah, 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 yeah. so I can't bring like huge amounts of experience. Or no, anything, it's just a, there is nothing to bring. Like so, you know, yeah. The, we, we used to meet once a month. Okay, you don't have to come every month. Right, but, right. We do this meetup. You right, say you can right. you see how it is. Yeah, Jack, did I cover everything? Thank you, you so much. Yes, okay. that's perfect. I received an email from your group that they postpone again our selection because they they select us. Yeah. And then they ask to change the title as they wish. And then we did. And then they ask technical question. And we start a collaboration with the high performance computer in yeah. uh, Europe. It's one of the biggest centers. And they are we are planning the trip for them to come here and host them and uh -huh. pay all the trip. And we thought we could organize better and not keep postponing. Yeah. I don't know if uh, if we say yes and no, we can start working on it. That's Who's the uh, Thomas with the point of contact uh, yeah. mainly. We we have this. I can add you in the email list or like put in CCN. Uh, send, no. send me an email. Okay. Just send me the last mail that you got from him. Okay. And then I'll see it. If I know him, I'll reach out. Okay. Yeah. It, it's this. It's an it's automatic email. Oh, uh, it's an automated thing? I think so, yeah. Because at the beginning you say that we select you and then uh, we we'll keep receiving this. Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know who the GTC content team is. 